you guys sing out this morning. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. The precious blood of Christ, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you ever wondered what it was like when we were doing this during COVID, it was sort of like this, all right? Just, is that too soon? Yeah, okay, too soon. Okay. We have 125 people at camp, uh, kids and staff, and then the parents who took their kids to camp just kept going. I don't know where they are. <laughs> they just kept going. And then all the people who can afford gas, there were two of those, they left to go somewhere, and the rest of them are just staying at home. So we're glad you were here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you're a guest, we're, we're really glad you're here. And uh, there is a card on the seat in front of you. You can uh, open the phone on your, uh, open the camera on your phone, uh, highlight that uh, little QR code, and it'll take you to all kinds of information, including an order of worship and a lot of other stuff. So that's going on. Uh, be sure to pick up one of these. If you don't have one of the communion packets, you'll need one of these. We don't pass them out these days. We pick them up on the way in. And this morning, communion is going to be kind of right in the middle of the sermon. So it's a little different, but that'll be okay. So here's the thing. If you ever hear a voice in your head telling you, you don't belong, or if you ever or sometimes feel like you're just guilty and you can't really say that there's one thing that you did or forgot to do you just have this feeling of guilt if you if you ever feel like you don't belong in the church or that you've wandered too far away for God to reach you I'm really glad you're here today because this morning it's all about reassurance let's stand we're going to pray and then we'll worship the Lord together. Holy Father, I want to pray for everyone in this room this morning that is doubting, that is afraid, 
that feels like they don't belong, that has that voice in their head telling them that they are guilty, 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 telling them that they are losers, that you don't love them, that you don't want them, and that they've wandered too far away for you to find them. God, fill us with the reassurance that can be found in Jesus Christ this morning. This is our prayer, and in his name, the whole church said, amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, precious of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. He is able. What concerns me today? He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever dream. Jesus, come to me, soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain, let me drink. to me as I fall down at your feet. Let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus I would see. Glorious, marvelous grace that rescued me.
And in light of what we have just sung, we too can ask the question, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, who, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardon, love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Come ye weary, heavy laden, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, down no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, down no more. Saints and angels, join in concert, sing the praises of the Lamb. While the blissful courts of heaven sweetly echo in his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hear we now his love proclaim. 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 Be seated. If you want to uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, that's where we're going to be this morning. It's over toward the back of the Bible. 1 John chapter 3. I would love for you, I want you, the scriptures are going to be on the screen, but I, it's, it would be really good if you were there either on your device or in your hard copy Bible because there are some things going on in that passage that uh, it's just good if you can, you can see them all. Uh, as we work through them. Uh, next week, uh, Shannon Bridges is going to welcome us at the beginning of the service, and then Dan and Tammy Beasley, one of our elders and his wife, are going to offer some communion readings and prayers, so we're looking forward to that. And we'll be in 1 John chapter 4 next week talking about love. That's where, we, if you want to read ahead, a little bit in 1 John chapter 4. The first few verses in chapter 4 are um, a little weird, and we'll touch on that, but we're going to get down to probably really start in verse 7 of chapter 4 next week if you want to go there. 
So while you're finding 1 John 3, and we'll, we're going to start in verse 19 in just a second, uh, I have a, a very dear friend named Matt Elliott, lives in Colorado Springs. Matt and I were in a college band together. I played saxophone, Matt played uh, guitar and piano, and uh, I remember we did a show once at a retirement center, and we were doing Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison. And they were not a very lively crowd, so to get the crowd stirred up, Matt stood up and started banging on the piano and then kicked the stool across the stage, and they were not impressed with that. <laughs> they did not like that at all. But I remember it. Uh, we, uh, then we worked together in Atlanta for many years where he was the worship leader at our church. And since it was a church of Christ, there was no piano stool to kick across the stage, but that's a, another controversy. Anyway, he's talented, he's smart, he's one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. And so years ago, he was on a panel discussion. And the moderator of this, I think it must have been a youth rally, I don't know what it was, but uh, the moderator asked the panelists to introduce themselves and include their name, where they were from, and their academic credentials. So the first guy says something like, my name is John Smith, Nashville, Tennessee, PhD, Vanderbilt University. And then Jane Doe, Atlanta, Georgia, D. Men, Candler School of Theology, and then Trevor Benford, EDD, Harvard. And so here's Matt, whose academic achievement at that point was a bachelor's degree from Fried Hardeman. And he leaned, which is a small Christian school in West Tennessee, he leaned forward and in a really formal tone, he said, Matt Elliott, Op Alabama, CDL, Georgia Department of Transportation. So. <laughs> CDL stands for commercial driver's license, in case you don't know, which he had to get when he was a youth minister because he had to drive the church bus. Matt has, and I've always envied this about him, he has the coveted gift of not caring what anybody thinks. I do not have that gift, and I'm guessing that a lot of us in this room and watching online don't have that gift either. We would have been absolutely mortified to sit on a panel full of people with lots of letters after their names from big fancy universities, and then here we are. We, we would have felt like imposters, like we'd snuck in the back door and as soon as they figured out who we were, they were going to perp walk us out the front. Okay, that feeling that, that you're not really what they think you are, that you're going to be found out, that you're fooling yourself and everybody else, that you're a phony, a fake, a fraud, that has a name. It's called, I mean, it's a real thing. It's called imposter syndrome. And it's like you have... Some of you know what this is because you've been there, right? It's, it's, it's like you have this impossible to please, constantly critical, never satisfied friend in your head who points out every mistake and minimizes every victory and incessantly whispers, you don't deserve success. You just got lucky this time. You're not as good as they think you are. You don't belong. And then so someone comes up and compliments you, or you win an award, or you get a promotion, or you succeed in some way, and you dismiss it, or you downplay it. See, imposter syndrome masquerades as humility, as self-deprecating modesty, but that's not what it is. It's self-doubt on steroids. And it's bad enough when that voice is talking about your, your job or your academic performance or your relationships because it sets you up for failure at your job or in school or, or with people. But when it tells you that you might fool everybody, but you can't fool God, God knows you don't belong. Well, that can crush your soul. That can wipe out your faith. You feel guilty all the time, and there's not enough evidence in the world to prove your innocence. And you don't ask for help, 
because that'll only confirm what you're afraid everybody else thinks. And you don't confess a sin, and you don't even confess a temptation to sin, because that would only reveal what you desperately want to hide from everybody else. And so you isolate yourself, and you try harder. But the harder you try, the louder that voice shouts, you don't belong. How dare you sing in church? How dare you take communion? How dare you volunteer to serve? How dare you even show up at church? You are guilty, guilty, guilty. You ever hear voices like that? You ever have thoughts like that? John's church apparently did. Because in in chapter 3, he addresses that very issue. So here's here's where where we're going to go this morning. We're going to read verses 19 through 24 of 1 John chapter 3. Then we're going to look at two reasons that we sometimes feel like posers. They're not the only two, but they are two that are in the text. And then we're going to let John give us the reassurance that we need. And in the middle of the sermon, we're going to pause and do something physical to root some of that reassurance deeper into our heart. And so while you worry about, oh my goodness, what physical thing are we going to do? You can just be stressed about that for a little bit. It's good for you. First Peter chapter, uh, First John chapter three, verse nineteen. Here we go. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. You see, he's addressing this very issue right here. This is how we know we belong to the truth, and and I love this phrase: how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. When you have a restless heart, how do you know you belong? How do you set that heart at rest? Verse 29, verse 20, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. Now, that probably raises a couple of questions for you. We receive from Him anything we ask. That's a really important question, and we're not going to do that today. It comes up again in chapter 5. When we get to chapter 5, we'll look back at this and deal with it when we get there. But this morning, you can just kind of wonder about that one, all right? Uh, so verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of, uh, of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. All right, so let's start by trying to figure out why we feel like spiritual posers, like we're guilty until proven innocent, that we don't belong. And John highlights two reasons uh, here in chapter 3. We didn't read this one, this verse this week. We did this one last week. But it's one of the reasons he gives is in verse 13. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. See, it's not always that nagging voice in your head that's telling you that you're guilty or that you're bad or that you're not a real Christian or that you're nothing at all like Jesus or that you don't belong. It's not always that voice in your head. The messages we get from culture are one of the reasons we feel like imposters. Like if you embrace the biblical sexual ethic According to most of the news media and all the famous actors and musicians, the storytellers and culture shapers of our culture, if you embrace the biblical sexual ethic, you're a homophobe or a transphobe or a throwback to the Puritans and you're probably getting ready to burn witches. Never mind that you really do believe that sexual intimacy is a good gift of God, a holy and righteous gift given to a man and woman who are married to each other. Never mind that you have gay friends whom you love and cherish, or that the other day you had a respectful conversation with that transgender person at school or at work and that you met in the grocery store and you tried to understand where they're coming from. If you embrace the biblical sexual ethic, you're a hater. You don't belong. You're on the wrong side of history. If you're pro-life, 
Well, you only care about a fetus and ignore what happens to it after it's born, even though you volunteer to work with inner city kids and grown men who are recovering from addiction and you give money to support foster kids and you quietly paid the light bill for that single mom down the street If you are pro-life, you just want to control women. You want to set up a theocracy. If you were were really a Christian, you would love and affirm everybody. You don't belong. That's the message that we get over and over and over and over. And John says, this is not new. Don't be surprised that you hear that a lot. In fact, in verse 12... He tells us exactly how old this concept, this idea is. He reminds us of Cain, who murdered his brother, Abel. Cain and Abel were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain murdered his brother. And it's interesting, the word murder there in verse 12 is, means butchered. It's the word usually used for what happens when animals are sacrificed on the altar. Cain butchered his brother. Why, John asks, because his actions, his actions, Cain's actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Look, we are living in a world where all the price tags have been switched, where all the values have been upended. What used to be right is now considered wrong. What used to be wrong is now considered right. Or as Isaiah put it, 800 years before Jesus, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you hear, you're not a good person. You're not a real Christian. You're not like Jesus. You're on the wrong side of history. If you hear that often enough, you'll begin to wonder, do I, do I belong? Or you'll begin to believe it. You'll feel like an imposter, like you don't belong. You can feel guilty for trying to do the right thing. And then speaking of Jesus, he's the other reason, this could rub you the wrong way, okay, if I haven't already, this could rub you the wrong way. Jesus is the other reason we sometimes feel like fakers, like posers, like imposters. In verse 12, John says, don't be like Cain. Okay, that's a pretty low bar, right? I don't have any desire to butcher my brother or sister. That's a, that's a low standard. I can live up to that one. He says, don't be like Cain. And then in verse 16, he says, be like Jesus. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Oh, well, just go ahead and reserve me a room in the hot place, because there's no way I'm going to live up to that standard. I don't even want to let the guy with his blinker on merge into my lane. I get mad at the lady who has too many items in the express lane at the grocery. I was terse with the server at at Outback because my steak was medium instead of medium rare. I am a horrible human being. I am nothing like Jesus. So culture is constantly telling me that I'm a hater, and church is constantly telling me to be like the sinless son of Jesus, sinless son of, of, of God. No wonder we feel like We're guilty all the time. No wonder our hearts condemn us. Those are not the only two reasons. There are many others, but those are the two John mentioned. So what do we do about that? John gives us some reassurance. Look at how verse 19 begins. Look down to verse 19. There's a a key phrase here that I want you to start looking for in chapter 3. In fact, a great way to do Bible study is look for oft-repeated words and phrases, and there's, there's a couple of them in chapter 3. John writes, this is how we know we belong. This is how we know we belong. That's a transitional phrase. It points back to everything he said earlier and forward to everything that he's about to say. How do we know we belong? How do we set our hearts at rest in in God's presence. Look for phrases that begin with the words, we know, or you know. They're all through chapter 3. Actually, they're all through John. That's the indicator. We know is the indicator, or you know. John gives us some reassurances. The first one's in in the last part of verse 2. 
And this is why I wanted you to be looking at your Bibles because you, you can see all these as they kind of flow together. It would be okay for you to highlight it on your device or underline it in your Bible. Uh, it helps to see the whole passage. We know, this is verse two, we know when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. How do you set your heart at rest? How do you overcome feeling guilty all the time by remembering that you are a work in progress. At this point in our spiritual development, we are not like Christ. We have not yet seen him as he is. We are a work in progress. But John says that when we do see him, when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That means that we're a work in progress. Paul touched on this concept in one of my favorite passages when he wrote to the troubled church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's 4th of July all the time if you're in Christ, if you are having the Spirit living in you. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, that's all of us, who with unveiled faces contemplate, meditate on, think about the Lord's glory are being transformed. You're not there yet. I'm not there yet. We're not there yet. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. We're under construction. Some of you more than others. Our, our renovation from sinful to shiny is not yet complete. The next time that voice whispers, you're not good enough. You don't belong. Talk back to it. Tell it, no, I'm not good enough. But he's not finished with me yet. I'm a work in progress. Okay, the second reassurance is in verse 5. You, you can find the indicator there, but you know. You know. How do we know? You know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. You are a work in progress, and Jesus lifts the weight of sin. Those words, take away, kind of a picture word in Greek that convey the idea of picking up something that's really heavy and carrying it away. In our case, the thing that needs to be carried away, the thing that we can't carry, is our guilt. It's too heavy for us to handle. We need somebody strong to take that off our shoulders, to bear that weight and take it away. John says that's why Jesus appeared. And some of your versions will say that's why he manifested. That's why he came. Jesus didn't come for the good people. He came for you and me. Earlier this year, we did a series in Luke's gospel where we looked at the table scenes where Jesus sat down to eat with some very unlikely people. In Luke 5, he, he, he goes to a party of some notorious sinners, and when he's criticized by the religious elite, he says to them, I didn't, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. When you feel the weight of shame, remember Jesus came to lift that burden. When that voice tells you, you don't belong, you're so guilty, God doesn't want to have anything to do with you, remember, remember Jesus came to take away your sin. Now here's the interesting thing. He knew we'd forget that. He knew we would minimize it. He knew that we would doubt it. And so he gave us a way to keep that idea front and center in our lives. It's called communion or the Lord's Supper. In the physical act of eating the bread and drinking the cup, we are reminded of a spiritual reality. Through the sacrifice of his body and blood, Jesus took away our sins. So I want you to go ahead and get out your communion packets. Go ahead and get those out. Be sure and open the right side first. And we're going we're gonna to pause right here in the middle of the sermon to do this physical thing that reminds us of this spiritual reassurance that he came to take away our sin. Uh, as, as we pray, I'm going to be praying the words of Psalm 103 to lead us into this. Let's bow together. Father, you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. 
You will not always accuse, nor will you harbor your anger forever. You do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you taken away our transgressions from us. Father, we, we, we receive this bread with gratitude and thank you that Jesus came to take away our sin. Amen. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still, my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne above. There is no vengeance in his cry. While it is finished, fills the sky, forgiveness is the final plea. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. My heart can barely take it in. He pardons all my guilty stains. Surrender all my shame to him. He breaks the curse of every chain. My sin is great, but greater still. The boundless grace his heart reveals. A mercy deeper than the sea. The blood of speaks for me. Let's pray again. Holy Father, forgive us for ever thinking that we could marshal enough willpower or produce enough good works or say no to temptation enough in order to ever qualify to have a relationship with you or to wipe out any debt that we incurred. If that were true, then there was no need for your son to come. But he came. He came here to take away what we could not take away ourselves. He came to take away our guilt and our shame and our sin. So help us believe that and trust it. And put all our hope in him not in ourselves. Thank you for taking away our sin. Thank you for the blood of Jesus and for this cup that reminds us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When my accuser makes the claim that I should die for my offense, I point him to that rugged frame where I found life at Christ's expense. See from his hands, his feet, his side, the fountain flowing deep and wide. Oh, he did shout the victory. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Let's stand. Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain. Jesus, Lord of all, glory to his name. Heaven crying out, let 
the earth proclaim power in the blood glory to his name Jesus oh let my soul arise and sing my confidence is not in vain the one who fights for me is king his hope is covenant remain no condemnation now i tread eternal hope is mine instead his word will stand i stand redeemed the blood of jesus speaks for me amazing love how can it be the blood of jesus speaks for me be seated so the third reassurance that john gives us is in verse 10 but i have to warn you this one isn't going to sound all that reassuring at first. John writes, this is how, and here's the indicator, we know. Remember, his question was, how do we set our hearts in rest in his presence? How do we know we belong? This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. And he mentions this in verse 14, this idea of love in verse 14. How do we know? We know we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Great. Just do what's right and love each other, and you can know that you know that you know that you're a child of God, not a child of the devil. I can think of at least six times last week when I did not do what was right, just in traffic. (laughs) Sometimes I have a hard time loving some people and a hard time loving some people all the time. This does not sound reassuring at all. But I want you to notice what John's focused on here. Your actions, not your feelings. Okay, so the first reassurance was you're a work in progress, okay? You're not there yet. Nobody expects you to be there yet. We will not be like Jesus until we see him as he is. We're all just a work in progress. The second one was for those moments when you fail, when you don't do it right, when you don't love, when you don't do the right thing, Jesus lifts that weight of sin. If you're a Christian, he will forgive. And the third one The third reassurance is, it's what you do, not how you feel. See, feeling like an imposter is what gives us fits. Feeling guilty, feeling like a fraud, feeling like the great pretender. John's like, let's focus on something else. Let's focus on what you do, not what you feel. Feelings, emotions, those are notoriously unreliable. And I want to be really careful here because the Bible warns us constantly all over the place to pay attention to what we think and what we feel and what's going on inside. Proverbs says, you know, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of your life. What's going on inside you in terms of your thoughts and your feelings, your emotions, that tends to leak out in behavior. So how we think and how we feel, that's, that's really critical stuff. But these days, how you feel has become the decisive factor in how people live. Just do what feels right. Just do what you feel in your heart. Authenticity means being true to your feelings, does it? Is how I feel the most trustworthy arbiter of how I act? Some guy in a little truck with loud pipes cuts me off in traffic? 
I want to pit maneuver the guy. Is that, is that right? If I'm standing in line and there's a lady in front of me and it's the express line and she's got 70 items, is it okay if I punch her in the back of the head because that's what I feel like? What if I feel like indulging a desire I know is wrong? What if I feel like ignoring a responsibility I know is right? What if I feel an attraction I know God forbids? What if I feel the pull of of a temptation that I know I should run from? That voice in your head is saying, see, you have all these nasty feelings. You must be a nasty person. You don't belong. There's a great line in that song we sang just a second ago. The accuser, when my accuser says things, Revelation 12, Satan is called the accuser of our brothers and sisters. He whispers to you and he screams at God that you don't belong. He shines a light on all your flaws, your most wicked thoughts, your darkest musings, and he uses that as evidence that you are a pretender. John offers more convincing proof. John says, okay, I know know you don't feel like loving. Don't care. Love with your actions. You don't love with feelings anyway. You love with actions. Love is a thing that you do, not not just a thing that you feel. Use your resources to alleviate the needs of a brother or sister. That's in chapter 3. Do the right thing when you feel like doing the wrong thing. Being tempted to do something is not a sin. Jesus was tempted. It's what we do, not what we feel. When that voice whispers, you did the right thing, but it doesn't count because it wasn't what you felt like doing. You didn't do it from proper motives. Just tell it back, you hush. Nothing I do counts. I did the right thing because I trust God more than my feelings. And speaking of God, John gives us one more reassurance. It's in verse 20. How do we know? We know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. So here are your four reassurances. You're a work in progress. That's number one. Jesus lifted the weight of sin. That's number two. It's what you do, not what you feel. That's number three. And God wants you anyway. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything everything. Bless his heart, when the great theologian John Calvin read that verse, he shuddered in fear. Calvin interpreted this verse to mean something like, if you think your heart condemns you, wait until you hear God's judgment. His judgment is greater than yours, and he knows everything. Calvin got a lot of things right. This one, he got wrong. God does know everything. He does everything about you. He knows what you think, knows what you do. And he wants you anyway. Lincoln, why don't you guys come on back up? Between 1875 and 1896 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Judge Isaac Parker condemned 79 men to the gallows. His court was called the Court of the Damned, and he was called the Hanging Judge. His motto was, permit no innocent man to be punished, but let no guilty man escape. God's a hanging judge, too, but not like Judge Parker. God's got a different motto. Judge Parker's motto was, permit no innocent man to be punished, let no guilty man escape. God's motto, God permitted an innocent man to be punished so that the guilty could escape. God hung the innocent man on the cross so you and I could escape. When that voice tells you, you don't belong, remember that. God knows everything. And God wanted you so much, he gave his son to save you. Let's stand. Let's sing together.
Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. It's really, really good to be here because I'm not at camp right now. <laughs> but I do have to go back, so pray for me. Um, I, I appreciate, and I, 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 you know, preachers have a tendency to embellish things, right? We get that. It makes it more interesting for everybody. But sometimes it's truth. And when Jody speaks earnestly about his own problems, like driving, it's really, really true. I have the occasion to ride with him often, and um, sometimes we'll just run to Publix over here for lunch. You know the new Publix? He can have 13 issues between here and Publix pretty easily. Sheesh, what are you doing? What's your problem? Would you speed up? Would you slow down? He can be three feet off of somebody's bumper and be yelling at the guy behind him, would you get off my bumper? <laughs> Amazing. You really should ride with him sometime. But... Not to be funny, that was a really, really good sermon. Really, really good sermon. And uh, I hope that we can live in assurance and be assured today in the grace and mercy of Jesus. A couple things, and we'll conclude. If you want to pull out your bulletin real quick, you can join me here. Uh, college students, you have a special college night at the home of Adam and Sarah Weigel. That's Tuesday, July the 12th from 5 until 10. You can check that out. I found this interesting. The ladies' ministry is doing a watercolor class. And I find that interesting because I can't paint. I mean, I mean, I can't paint. I mean, I can't paint the bathroom wall. I can't paint at all. Um, but this is interesting to go and be together and learn how to do some watercolor painting. So check that out. There's limited spots. Dinner and a Devo. Wednesday night is picnic night. And um, we're having hamburgers and hot dogs. HICLC kids will be doing their little performance. Their parents will be here, their families. So please come intending to meet some people you don't know and sit with them and make them feel welcome. Please do that. And lastly, uh, First Stop, our monthly cooking for the homeless shelter. First Stop is Thursday from 9.30 to 11, I believe. And uh, we need volunteers to come help make lunches and dinner for that. It's always a good time. So join us for that if you're available. And mostly, I hope you have an awesome day and a fantastic 4th of July. Don't blow anything up. Make sure you cook something good. And um, I'll be at camp. Thank you. May the amazing grace of Jesus bless you and give you peace. We'll see you next week.